Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's Make for Tomorrow uh, participatory workshop. If you've never been to a Make for Tomorrow um, session before, you're very welcome. We are so happy that you're here. If you've done some of them before, welcome back. We're glad to, glad to have you all, all come on in. Um, I'm going to say this bit a little bit slowly just to give us all time to make sure we're all in this virtual room together and, and everyone's kind of comfy and set up. Um, while, we, while people are kind of coming in, I'll just uh, introduce myself. So hello everyone. My name is Lucy. I work for Sussex Partnership Trust. I'm the Arts and Health Lead. So our programme is called Make Your Mark. And um, the Make for Tomorrow project is um, is our live project that Make, Make Your Mark are doing right now. Um, it's a really exciting online participatory programme of lots of different events. So some art workshops like the one this afternoon, some other projects and also some uh, live in conversations with various faces that you might recognize from TV and film etc and um, we this project is really brilliant it's really about bringing us all together in these very strange times but yeah it's hopefully moments in the week where we can come together be creative explore learn stuff about each other and ourselves and hopefully just bring a bit of hope and connectedness yeah in these rather unusual and and challenging days um so the project make for tomorrow is uh it's been running since the beginning of september and it's going to run all the way through till early november with these weekly events that are happening it's delivered in partnership and again apologies for those of you who've been here before and have heard me say all this before but very important I say it because um, this is uh, the lovely thing about this is that it's a partnership project so yes it's us at the trust but it's also done in partnership with the amazing hospital rooms who are a fabulous organization that work with visual artists and they're all about working in a participatory way to transform clinical spaces to make them more beautiful more pleasant to be in and uh yeah and to hopefully inspire and instill creativity into into daily life and i'll introduce you to them in a minute and they can tell you a little bit more about what they do um and the other partner is arts over borders so they're also an interesting organization who work with lots of actors and writers and musicians and performers they put on events in unusual places so it's kind of fitting because this virtual world is in itself an unusual place um so they have uh, been bringing in and uh, talking to and getting involved with um, some actors and performers who have been part of the program and continue to be and then we also have the fabulous cog app so i don't know about you guys technology is not my forte um, but these screens and this way of connecting with each other has become increasingly important and cog app have been amazing in helping make sure that we get it all set up so hopefully it's nice and accessible for you to be able to join us and they told us which buttons to press to make sure that we don't have any technical glitches um so yep it's a partnership project and we're just really excited to be working with these three fabulous organizations so this afternoon we've got a really exciting participatory workshop with the wonderful artist rebecca and uh, um, but I'm going to say goodbye to you for now and I'm going to hand over to Phoebe who is a project curator at Hospital Rooms and is drawing together the, all the visual art um, content of Make for Tomorrow and she'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we're going to get up to this afternoon but enjoy. <laughs> Thank you Lucy. Hi everyone I'm Phoebe and I'm a project curator at Hospital Rooms. Thank you so much as Lucy said for joining us for this fabulous workshop with um, Rebecca Byrne. I'm just going to start a little slideshow to give you a bit more information about what we're about. Um, so as I said, I'm a project curator for hospital rooms. We transform inpatient mental health units with incredible contemporary art. And you might see my colleague Tim also here. Um, so we put this program together alongside Make Your Mark and we're incredibly grateful to have this opportunity to be um, zooming in to all of you today. Um, so just a few little housekeeping rule or notes before we start. Um, this recording is, um, is, well, this video is being recorded. So no one is visible or audible apart from Rebecca and the hospital rooms team. And this is just for sort of privacy, privacy and security reasons. And it's so that it can be uploaded to the Make Your Mark YouTube later. Um, we'd really like you to sort of share with us the artworks that you do from today and Lucy will be sending a Dropbox link um, around after this too. Um, as well as this, we also want this to be a really interactive workshop, so please do pop any questions or comments you have for Rebecca into the little Q&A box at the bottom and I will read them out to her so it becomes a really much more like a conversation. Um, so Rebecca Byrne is an artist and a curator. She's worked with us um, on a project at Woodlands, 
um, in the bedroom corridor there. And she also does a lot of painting. So this workshop is drawing from her experiences in Lisbon, where she spent some time on a residency looking at the way that nature sort of interacts with architecture and the beautiful tiles in Lisbon is there. So I'll just hand over to Rebecca now and we can begin. Thank you. Great. So over to you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and welcome to my studio in East London. Uh, if you were actually here, I would offer you tea and biscuits, but I hope you have tea and biscuits wherever you are. Um, so I'll, a little bit about my practice. As Phoebe mentioned, I'm a painter primarily. And I did a residency in Lisbon, which is what I based the ideas for this workshop around. Um, I was interested in how the, the whole city, whether you're inside buildings or outside buildings, are peppered with all these really beautifully painted tiles and how no matter how much man tried to intervene and make these beautiful spaces um, inside and outside, nature was always kind of interceding as well and there'd be little plants popping up through the cracks and I kind of thought that that was an interesting kind of dialogue between how we live in the world and no matter what we do nature's always going to be finding a way in and taking over in kind of a healing positive way so I really liked that. Um, so I did a whole series of paintings kind of exploring those ideas. Today I thought I'd start by going through some of the materials I'm going to use and then um, we can kind of go from there. I'm using acrylic paint Oh good, just now you guys can see what I have. So I've got a little bit of a palette over here. Um, my paints are all laid out. I like to organize them generally by color, the blues, the greens, the reds and the yellows over here, um, but that's just a rough thing. Um, you can use any kind of paint. Poster paint is fine. Acrylic paint is great because it dries quickly. So for something like this, it's kind of nice because we can work in layers and we don't have to wait a long time for it to dry. And then you'll see my brushes. I like to use an array of weird different brushes. Um, these are things that are much beloved. You can see they're quite beaten up. This is one of my favorites. Depending on which brush you choose, you get different sorts of marks. These are really beautiful, elegant brushes. I also like to use for more specific marks. Um, and then sometimes over time, your tools just get kind of scruffy, but I make marks with things like um, chopsticks and um, bits of wood and stuff like that. So. It's all kind of, anything is great to paint with, in my opinion. I know what I'm first going to start off with is a piece of acrylic paper, which hopefully you have as well, and, and some tape. This is a trick I learned for, from an American artist. Um, in order to keep his paper on the surface and not have to touch it all the time, because as you're using it and it gets um, painty, you will want to use a very technical term there. You'll find that you don't want to touch your painting or touch the paper, but you need to keep it still. So what you do is you take your tape, tear off your masking tape roughly, put it upside down underneath the edges of the paper like this to make corners. And you do it on both sides of each corner so that the sticky side is up. And then you go back to your tape and take two more pieces. And you put it over, you line up your paper so it's where you want it to be. I've done this all and then realized I'd take my paper down wonky. So take a second to make sure it's right. And then you put the taper, the, pa bleh, the tape face down. So it's gummy to gummy paper or tape. And you don't go over the edges of the paper. And that means when we're painting, you can glide over onto all of this and it holds your paper steady. And you, don't, and you don't have to, you can get all the way to the edge. So I'm gonna go around all four corners and do that now, quickly. Um, it's always fun to, like I said, I learned this from an American artist named Woody Othello. And it was funny because when I, I heard him say this in a film and uh, he said it like, oh, you know, everybody knows how to do this. And I thought to myself, I don't know how to do this. And this is a really great idea. So it's really great to learn from other artists as well. So I'll just quickly go around my edges. And you could do kind of a cheat, which is doing those circles of tape. You probably did when you were little and in school and or your mom would tape things down for you and just make a, a roll of tape. And that kind of works, but it doesn't work as well as this in terms of keeping things really steady so you can, I like to sometimes paint really aggressively and move my brush around quite fast. 
And if you'd like to paint like that and don't like to have to worry about keeping your paper still, um, this is much better than those little um, donuts or circles of paints we're all familiar with using when we were kids. So just going around these last ones. Almost done with this part. Also, I'm using painter's tape here, which is called frog tape. And that means it's more delicate with papers, but any kind of masking tape is fine. Any tape that you have with you. Um, and if you wanna make it less uh, ad adhesive or less gluey, just put it on your trousers or the arm of your sleeve or something for a second and peel it back off quickly. And that will take a little bit of the adhesive off of the tape. And you don't have to worry that when you undo it from the back of your paper, that you will um, tear anything. Although you should be fine with regular masking tape anyway. So now you can see my paper is pretty well stuck to the surface and we can begin. So I start with a monochromatic base. I'm really into blues these days. So what I'm gonna do is take this blue, work, I'm gonna work with these three actually, to kind of give you uh, the step for the beginning. I'm gonna take the lightest one for the background color. Then I'm gonna pick another one step up for me um, and paint the pattern between the, using these two colors. And then this I'm almost gonna use as my drawing tool color. You can see the color better from the bottom. And that's gonna be the blue that I use later on for basically drawing. But you can use any three colors you like for this monochromatic start. Um, these are just my choices today. And then the other thing I cho I'm choosing to do is you know you get any sort of a little dish is great and these are tops of takeout bins and or takeout containers and um, all sorts of stuff. Um, you take I'm mixing in a bit of medium. This is called pouring medium in case you're curious as to what I'm using. Um, pouring medium is a medium is anything you add to a paint to make it behave differently basically. And so if you want your paint to be more transparent or shinier or not shiny, more matte, anything you want. You can do that with by adding a medium, but you don't need any of these things. Um, and the equivalent to doing this right now would be just to use water. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna paint uh, with my favorite brush, as I mentioned, big hairy brush, uh, a background color down on the surface of the painting first. And this will be the basis for everything that comes after it. Um, I used to do a lot of strictly monochromatic painting so this is almost like my own history starting off on the, as the base layer with these. And I like to show a lot of marks. So as you can see there, it's not about being perfect or getting a perfectly flat color. Um, and the medium thins out the paint. So that's why you can see these sorts of marks more easily than if I had just used straight paint. Similarly, water will do the same thing. Um, the difference paint is basically pigment mixed up with something to hold the pigment together. And a medium is something that is added to that, which also has a quality of holding the pigment together. Water, you can add water to it and have that same sort of change the quality of your paint and how your paint moves around, but you will be kind of diluting how, how well the paint is held together. So if you do use water, just don't use tons of it. Not if you're using acrylic paints. Watercolors, whole different ballgame. Okay, so then here I have my surface color and then I might go back over it, get rid of some marks, add others, and basically just cover the paper like that quite quickly. The other thing to do if you're working with acrylic paint is put it into water frequently and right away because otherwise your brushes will get trashed and I've learned that the hard way for sure. Um, now the next color I'll use is that medium blue. I'm just gonna squeeze out a splodge of that. And because this is all still very wet, obviously, I like to take um, some paper. This is just regular paper towels, or oh, sorry, that's an American word, kitchen roll. Uh, take kitchen roll and just put it down on top. And you can do that to kind of blot the surface a little bit to accelerate the drying. And then that way, when I paint my pattern on top of this, it'll still, the two blues will interact with each other, but a little bit less. So you don't pick up a ton, but you pick up a little bit. So my next step will be to take this smallest brush I have, 
So any kind of a small brush is fine. And then I'm gonna use this color to start drawing the basis for what will be my idea of what the tiles would look like. This is also, so you start off at a corner, I right-handed, so I start off at the far upper left and I wind up going in this direction and I'm just basically drawing lines to indicate the beginning of my pattern. They're not, they don't have to be perfect. They're not meant to be perfect. It's just about enjoying the feeling of making a line and generally making them about as even as you like, as even as you can. And you can also do this pattern and have them much further apart. I'm putting mine like this because this is the kind of scale that I like for my pattern. But you could always make yours a lot bigger if you want bigger squares in your background. Rebecca, we've also just had a question just asking whether yeah. the, the sort of colors you're using or the color scheme has um, anything to do with um, Lisbon or your sort of influence from Lisbon. Well, actually, it's interesting that you say that because uh, there is a building in Lisbon which is made entirely up of these uh, blue tiles. It's inside the building, outside the building, it's super famous um, and everybody talks about it. And when I went to go see it myself, I was really uh, blown away by it. It's really an uh, interesting building. I can't remember what the original purpose of it was. It seemed like it was almost like a community center or some sort of communal space, but it's very well known for its beautiful blue tiles. Mm. Um, but also blue is just kind of, for me, it's a, a color that I use a lot. Um, maybe it's the range of it. I like cool blues, warm blues. And for me, as a background color to a lot of things, it's really, um, it just, I think it works well with a lot of other colors. So now going into making more of like this lattice pattern, I start, um, again, I go from left to right, but any corner doesn't matter. And you can kind of start from this corner here and sort of generally wind up at another corner like that. And you're just doing the same thing, generally keeping the spaces about the same. Don't worry too much about it. And if you don't wind up joining up with another area on the other side of the paper, doesn't matter, not a big deal at all. And you can do these as thinly as you like as well. I and mean, if you have a, a narrower brush, that's fine too. But I, I enjoy seeing the the line, so mine's a little, it's narrow, but it's not that narrow. And now we have the basis for what's gonna be the beginning of our background pattern. So then I'm gonna wind up using this brush. I like the marks that this makes because I can kind of control it, but I can also work really quickly. Um, and the, I'm using the same color that I used to draw the pattern. So you almost won't, you won't see this basically at the end. So pick up a little bit of the paint here, start in any one of the tiles that you like and just make these sweeping sort of gestural marks. You can go super fast like that. Um, it's not about totally filling it in. You can again, thin out the paint with a bit of water or a medium. And then you'll see how that becomes so much more transparent than the other ones. And personally, I like to mix that up and for me, uh, it's all about the, not all about, but what's important to me is the gesture in painting. So I like the idea that you could see the marks that someone made um, and feel the person's hand in their work. So each one of these can be as gestural as you like. You can fill them all in completely if you prefer that, anything you want. And then sometimes, if I get worried that I get so um, kind of absorbed in what I'm doing, because this is kind of relaxing and meditative, I'll just to remind myself where I'm at so I don't accidentally fill the wrong shapes, I'll go across and just put like a dot in each one. So I know that which are the ones I want to paint and which are the ones I don't want to paint. Um, but you don't have to do that either. And then this is just kind of relaxing. Go through each one. We've just had a comment as well, just from someone saying that they're absolutely loving this and Rebecca is very clear. Oh, good. 
<laughs> good. I'm so glad because this is the first time I've done this. So thank you very much to whoever said that. You're a good confidence boost for me. <laughs> So th it's funny how this is one of my favorite things to do in painting, which is to kind of do something really um, repetitive. And then the other favorite thing is to do something that's not at all repetitive, which is what we'll do next. Yeah. And the other thing you could do is if you don't like being um, as monochromatic as this, I mean, this could really be a basis for a painting that had five or six different shades of blues in it. Um, you could have this row be one blue, this be the next, and, and so on. So if you have more things there and you'd like to do a more dynamic background, go for it. Don't feel you have to just stick to two colors as I have here. And are there other patterns um, people can do? Are you, is there a particular reason why this pattern works for you? No, you know what it is? I like this one because um, when it turns out wonky, I think it still looks nice. If I tried to do squares going this way, like a grid, to me that just isn't, um, it, if it's wonky, it looks, it like annoyed me, it made me frustrated. <laughs> and I also just like this um, kind of a diamond shape more than doing a grid of squares because it feels a bit more open or something. But you can do any shapes. Um, you know, you could do, trying to think of what would be easy enough to do. Oh, see, I almost made a mistake on my pattern here. Um, I suppose it's a combination of this is a fairly quick one to do when it's just your background. I could never do something curved or circular, but you could, what, what, I, what I have done in the past is cut out a shape and instead of, oh, I should have brought one of those to show you. Instead of doing like, okay, you could use a cap of, from the paint bottle and you could, um, dip it in paint and then make a mark like that. And you could make a pattern of doing something of that nature if you wanted to do something else. So sometimes I will make a particular shape for myself and then I'll use that and basically almost use, use it as an impression as I go along. Um, but I do this one when I'm just doing it freehand. The other thing I do um, to add texture, because I, as I was saying, I use a lot of layers in my work and a lot of transparency. But another thing, um, remember how earlier I blotted this background color? Um, the other thing I like to do is I go through the shops and look for the patterns on the kitchen rolls all the time. And this one is one I particularly like. And again, if you press that down here and pull it back, some, you, you can get an impression. Let me do a thicker one and then I can show you. Also, you can, if you ever want to remove paint, obviously just take your towel and wipe the clumpy paint off. This one I'm going to try to make very clumpy to show you what another thing I like to do to add um, texture. So you can take your towel and press it down. And this one should, oh, it's not working for me, of course. Well, you can kind of see it some, somehow. Well, if I've put the right amount of paint on versus the towel, you can sometimes get the patterns from the towels showing up in these background um, squares of color, which adds another element of mark making and pattern making. Um, and you can get them with circles or all sorts of different patterns. So, some, so that's another thing that I, I like to do to add some layers and some textures to things. You can also take sponges that you've cut into different shapes and press them down. So there's lots of different ways to add other types of texture. But this is basically the beginning for me, having this kind of a background pattern that um, gives us something to work from. And in Lisbon, each one of these tiles would have had some sort of a, a pattern or something going on with them. So you can also go back in and add to the pattern of your tile if you like. Um, you can do simple things like put a dot in the center of each one very finely and delicately. You can make it more impactful and kind of have them all over on some of the tiles. That's kind of up to you. If you'd like to do that and spend more time on your background, you're more than welcome. 
I'm going to leave mine kind of like they are for the purposes of today. Um, but that's just another way that you could spend some time working on something like this and just treat each one of these individual shapes as another opportunity to try something new. Today, we're going to take the darker blue paint that I mentioned earlier that I'm gonna basically use as my drawing color of paint. And I just start thinking about things like, okay, what if a flower was coming out of here and growing along the cracks? Maybe it has a leaf at the base of it. And then I look at a lot of plants that are either struggling to thrive or are extinct. I'll look at images of fossils. And I saw this one fossil, which had an imprint of this flower that really stuck with me, I think, because it was both so fragile, because the stem was super thin. And then it had these wispy uh, kind of leaves to whatever this flower had been. And I also like looking at things like fossils because you don't know what color they were and you don't really know what they looked like. So it's nice to kind of add in whatever your idea might be of how it looks. So my shapes today are just looking like this. And then I'm gonna put another smaller one maybe coming out of somewhere lower down here. And any shapes you like, it can be this one that I tend to favor, this flower. And I like to play with scale. So to have some areas be tiny like that and some of the petals be really long like that. I'm sure that actually never existed, but I just like that idea. And some might be very skinny. Um, and then I might have like, sometimes there were little things that looked like weeds that were just coming up out of the cracks, very spindly little things. So I also like that mixture of making something that's very spindly and tiny um, and putting that next to something that's more, uh, that's larger and has more of a presence to it. By putting them together, somehow it kind of creates a little bit of a, of a conversation between the two things. And then I'll also layer things over each other. Now, I'm gonna make this kind of a leafy shape and I'm gonna, it has gone over the top of that one, but that's fine. And I'm gonna make it go down this way as well. And maybe I'll make another one over here. And that's it. So when I feel like, okay, I'm kind of satisfied with how I've mapped things out and drawn things out, then I get really excited because I can start thinking about color. So if you can start a new palette or you don't have to, you can use this old one, but I'm using a small one so you guys can see what I'm doing. Normally this would be quite large and I would start expanding. So I lay out my colors depending on the colors that I wanna use for the day. And then on the palette, I kind of keep them in groups as well. So I might keep all the greens in the same spot and that's because I'll tend to dip in and out of different colors so that I can kind of tweak it. So if I want a little bit of one thing happening or another thing happening, I like to have them next to each other. So as a general principle, I kind of roughly order things that way, but you don't have to. Um, and I'm using a combination of different types of acrylics as well, meaning that some are really um, liquidy and called and really fluid and others are more um, solid and a bit thicker paint and I and I like using both of those together because then that gives you kind of a different consistency overall and this pink I'm absolutely addicted to which is kind of funny because I'm not a very pink person in my wardrobe or growing up or anything but as a painter I really love that pink um, and then that's a very light red then I might add another more purpley red. And white is always good too. I also just had a question or a sort of comment come through about this sort of juxtaposition between the more fluid lines and the repetitive mm -hmm. patterns and whether this is something that you sort of use a lot in your work. 
Yeah, I do because I like that tension between something that's very loose and very free and then also the rigidity of some um, sort of a, a pattern. And I guess it's because maybe like in life, I always think it's good to have things in balance and you need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I think about that in my paintings as well and in terms of color also. So I find, you know, when I'm working, I'm moving, ch changing the colors even within itself. So you'll see when I start painting that even the monochrome, you know, what looks like a yellow petal might have moments where it, it oscillates towards more orange or, or to a lighter yellow or something. And that's, oops, sorry, I don't know what that noise was. Sorry, guys. And that's what, um, yeah, that kind of interests me, that balance between things. Also, another tip is I uh, have multiple pots of water. So when I first am rinsing my brushes, I'll have uh, like the main pot that takes out most of the pigment. And then I'll use another one to kind of really clean the brush up. And then after you've dipped it and swished it around in the water, wipe it off really good for yourself. Double check, do it again. And you'll still have a little bit of, you'll still have a lot, I guess, of blue on your paper towel. But for me, it doesn't interfere with how I want to paint. I'm not really a purist. I don't have like a brush for each color. And I do a lot of mixing on the palette and a lot of mixing on my painting, which you'll see in a minute too. So I know that I want these spindly flowers to have yellow petals. So I'm going to start with the yellow. Someone, I kind of, sorry, yeah. sorry, someone just asked, what is the name of the pink color you're using or what shade is it? It is called a uh, light portrait pink. And again, it's uh, all the stuff I'm using today is, is all by Liquitex because they very kindly and generously provided me with the materials. Um, and they're great stuff. <laughs> uh, so now I'm using two different yellows and kind of mixing them up together. And I hope you can see that adding this other yellow actually makes this a bit different shade to that one but I keep them still quite similar so that I can um, mix them up and kind of bounce back and forth between the two. And here's some more medium again, but also you can use water. It's just as, just as effective for using in this way. And then I don't know if you can tell, but I like to have the difference between very thick marks like that and thinner marks. And then also I'll often turn my brush around and draw into it. So maybe thinking about how a petal might have like a vein that runs down the center of it. And maybe there's other marks that go out like that. Or you can draw along the edge of a curve. Um, so besides the painting, I'm also drawing back into the paint as well. Now I'm gonna mix um, maybe a bit of a stronger yellow with just a little bit. Red's a really powerful color. So when you mix in some reds, be careful because it'll sometimes give you an unexpected result and not always what you want. And then as you can see here, sometimes when I'm layering one color on top of the other, I'll just play around with how I move the paint around so that I can kind of pull it off again as well. And you can see the pattern underneath coming through, kind of like as if the sunlight were coming through a petal and a flower or something. And, and you can see the backgrounds. And I'm going over here. Now here's where I had the green and the yellow overlap each other. So I'm gonna paint my yellow color as if it is behind this green leaf that's laying on top of it. So I'll just do that. And then also I'm still always making all my marks very gesturally, loosely. It's not about being perfect, perfect. It's just about laying on the colors that you like. And then I might actually draw back in along the line of that yellow petal like that. Then I'll come back later and add the green in. Now maybe I'll do a lighter, brighter yellow. A white like I'm using, which is titanium white, is a really opaque white. 
So if you add that to your colors, you will really obliterate the pattern behind this versus something like that. So it's good to kind of keep those things in mind so you can decide which, you know, what, you what you'd like to do and, and how you'd like it to look. And here's my other smaller flower down here. Also, you can make different marks depending on how you move your brush and turn your brush, whether you're using the a broad stroke like that or picking it up and using it like that. And again, I'm scratching in, drawing. and bringing that blue back up through the yellow as opposed to painting it on top, gives it a completely different effect. And lets you make all sorts of different marks with paint. Let's see. And in this one, I'll just decide that that petal goes on top of the green leaf. Lots of paper towels are key. So now I'm gonna go into that pink. So I'm gonna wash my brush a little bit better. And I'll probably, actually I'll switch to a new one so that I can pick up this pink that I love so much. And I'm gonna use that on these big leaf shapes. It's also nice to use your paint really loosely because you can really fill in an area of color and see how you like it. And then you might think, okay, I wanna adjust that, I wanna make it thicker. And here I'll add some of the medium and some white to make it even lighter and do this small leaf in a lighter version. Or you can pick up some of that red and make it a bolder pink. So you can kind of see even working with a, a small palette, you can, or a small range of colors, I should say, limited palette, you can still do a lot. And I like this purpley color too, so maybe we'll have one of the leaves at the base of the flower be that color. Now I'm gonna move on to these kind of delicate spindly pieces that I put in here, and I'm just gonna draw over them with that purple. I don't know if it's looking right on the screen. It almost looks like a black on the screen, but really it's a purple. Let me try to lighten that up so you can see more of what it actually looks like. Phoebe, does that look like purple or does it look like black? And it now looks more like purple, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I sorry? I was just going to say, if anyone is is using different colors or want to wants to share what they're sort of using as well, um, just drop drop them in the chat box, and we can 
discuss what what sort of color schemes are going on yeah absolutely i mean i don't really have any um hard and fast rules either it's it changes you know i could do this workshop next week and i'd be really into something else it's also interesting to see how colors react again with each other there's a famous painter called joseph albers and he did a series of paintings called homage to the square which are super famous and he was always basically exploring what happens inside your mind's eye when you look at a color next to another color and how different they appear to each other. So now I'm going to go back in and I'm going to reestablish my stem for my flower because now that everything else is going on, I feel like it's a little bit harder to see it. So I'm going to go in with this kind of a purpley violet. So I took some blues, I took some of this red. And I'm going to see how I feel about that being the color for the stem. And just to say, Rebecca, we've got um, around five to 10 minutes left. Perfect. I think we should finish just on time then. So now the last thing I'm going to do is go back in and look at the um, green shapes that I made, which reference the um, project that I did for Phoebe and Tim at hospital rooms in Ipswich, um, where I went to a beach in the area and I learned that there were these sea cabbages that lived on the beach and they only live in a few places on earth and um, Shingle Street Beach is one of them. And I found them really fascinating because they're becoming extinct because their natural habitat is getting encroached upon. And they were these, they look like cabbages, um, but a little bit different and they had these kind of wiggly edges to them and they cover this beach. And I liked the idea that they had this resiliency about them um, and they wound up working into the painting that I did and for that project. And now they work into my paintings here and there all the time. And I really love these sea cabbages. Uh, and I read somewhere, I don't know if this is exactly true, but I did read that the sailors used to eat them as a source of nutrition when they had to. I don't think they taste very nice, but you, they had to boil them something like four or five times before they could become edible. And I'm not surprised because they look like they'd be very hard to digest. <laughs> but I loved the fact that they were growing and thriving on this beach, kind of nestled amongst the shingle. So they were like growing in nothing because they weren't growing in, I didn't actually know that plants could grow in rocks. Um, like I've seen air plants before, but I'd never seen plants in nature that are growing without soil. Mm. And so I found them kind of fascinating. And they have this fun wavy shape to them. So I'll use some transparent colors, some more opaque colors. And again, draw back into these. Are they similar plants to the ones in Dungeness near Derek Jarman's house or are they? I don't know. I, I, it's so funny. Uh, Facebook reminded me that I'd been in Dungeness six years ago yesterday. And I was <laughs> So funny you should ask that. But we had the most <laughs> idyllic day there, but no, I don't. I don't know. But they, when I saw them, I did think of Dungeness. They look like something that would grow there. Yeah. So again, with the greens, I'm using a Viridian, which is a a bolder green, um, and I'm using this aqua color that I like a lot, and a little bit of. I'm going to use a little bit of this lime green because I love lime green. Um, a very shocking one but this is still since my brush is full of the viridian that's what i mean that i kind of mix colors when they're laid out as well and draw back into it i might add some lime green over here and then There you kind of have it. Mm. You can add more plants once you get going. You might find that you want to put something here or add some more petals to that one or make some more big leaf shapes. Um, but basically, uh, you can kind of make this what you like. Mm -hmm. It's a really lovely composition. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, thanks. I suppose that's another thing. If I think about where I start certain plants, it's nice to have that grid background because I always make sure to start one maybe up here, some down there, coming at you from different spaces. Um, mm. We've just had some comments in saying absolutely fan fantastic. Um, I can't believe that this happened in 45 minutes. It's incredible. Um, and another person saying, what a lovely um, composition. I absolutely love the colors. Another person saying, nice process. We are really enjoying this and we'll probably keep going after the workshop. Oh, good. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'll just do this for ages and just take this paper off and then put a fresh one down. That's the other thing, going back to the tape thing at the beginning, you can take this off once it's a bit, probably a bit more dry than it is now, and then leave your taped corners down and reuse them. You don't have to make those again each time. So if you did do the taped corners, as you can see, they stay on the table here and you just lay your next sheet of paper down and go again. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'll just, we've got a flurry of comments coming in, so I'll just read them out before we end. But um, uh, someone's saying, thank you so much, um, Rebecca. We are a group of two service users taking part um, and the activities coordinator is writing the message. Um, we've got another message saying, thank you so much. It gives me confidence to come up with a painting to give someone for Christmas, fingers crossed. Uh, uh. And thank you so much. And thank you. It was amazingly fun. So thank you, Rebecca. That was really, really fantastic. And I agree. I can't believe um, that this beautiful composition happened in 40 minutes. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm so glad um, everyone really enjoyed that. And I think I'll just hand back to Lucy um, to do some closing comments before we end. Um, just another comment quickly. So inspiring. Thanks a million, Rebecca. Makes art seem possible even for someone without painting experience. And it helps me to look more closely at my surroundings too. So lots of lovely, lovely comments coming in. Um, so thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and yes, I'm sure Lucy will be talking about the coming workshops, but um, tune in next week for Hannah Brown, who will be doing a landscape painting workshop, probably not too far off from this one. Um, well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. I really, it was my pleasure today. Well, thank you. I'll hand back to you now, Lucy. Oh, hi all. Wow, I couldn't agree more. How amazing that in a matter of sort of 40, 45 minutes, you've got this beautiful, vibrant, gorgeous um, thing that's sort of popping into your eyes. It's be absolutely beautiful, Rebecca, amazing. I have to admit, <laughs> once I'd said my hellos and stuff, I was scrabbling around trying to look for some paints. Um, I couldn't <laughs> find any. All I could find was some pencil crayons. So I did give it a little whirl, but I think... Um, I'm sure if you're anything like me, although 45 minutes, it's remarkable what what has been created. Actually, this is something that you, if you've got time and you want to, to just keep going with and keep adding to, and um, yeah, maybe come back with. Um, as Phoebe mentioned, we re we've recorded this session, so and we'll put it up on the Make Your Mark website, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel. So do find it if you want to revisit it and 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 keep making and keep getting inspired. That was just so totally wonderful phoebe did also mention we would love to see what everyone has been making um in this session either live now or like i say if you if you carry on or you pick it up tomorrow or next week or whenever so um do keep an eye out those of you who registered um online keep an eye out for an email we'll be sending one out probably sometime in the next couple of days um and we'll have there's a drop box that we've created for this project um so if you do want to take a photo and share share your work with us we would love it and i'm sure rebecca would love to see what what you guys have been up to um, but we are also hope yeah exactly yeah. um but we hope creating a bit of a gallery of all the work that's been made by everyone over the course of makes so we would love it if you wanted to um, share your work with us. That'd be amazing. Um, but for now, it's just all I've got to say is a huge, huge thank you to Rebecca. That was completely wonderful, Rebecca. Thank you so much for giving your time and your, yeah, you were really, I agree with whoever wrote that comment in. It's really accessible and it sort of uh, takes away some of the fear that can come when we want to, when we feel we would like to be creative. I think mm -hmm. often there's these things that hold us back, but you really opened it up and made it so kind of easy to, to do it <laughs> and, and to be amazed by what then come, comes out. And, and I loved right at the beginning, you said, I, I'm sure I'm not quoting your exact words, but you said something about you really enjoy seeing the human touch in the marks. 
having yeah, exactly. so often a sense that you're me it's meant to look kind of perfect and finished, but actually you're absolutely right. Seeing seeing that humanity in those marks is it gives it an energy that's um, really exciting. Um, so I hope hope new lot at home or in the hospital wards or wherever you are, whether you're in an office in 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 your living room, yeah, in in, in a hospital somewhere. Um, yeah, we I hope you've had a really good time. So just to let you know, and I'm going to try like I said technology is not my forte but I'm just going to quickly try and share with you the posters for the next upcoming event so on Friday um very excitingly we have got the actress Fiona Shaw um if you've not heard of her she has been in Harry well she's been in loads of things but she's been in Harry Potter and um and uh Killing Eve, she was the, the spy in Killing Eve. Killing Eve. So she's going to be doing an in conversation on Friday afternoon um, where she'll be having a chat um, just about her experiences of living through these COVID times and hopefully revealing a little bit of, of the ups and downs of being an actor sort of when you're performing, but also what life is like when you're not performing. Um, so let me just quickly show you that poster. Where is she? Is that the right one? Yep, there we go. Um, so do if you're if you're interested and would like to come along, you can hear her chatting. We similar to this these webinar sessions through Zoom, you can ask her questions live. So in the same way that Phoebe was taking your questions and and uh, passing them on to Rebecca this afternoon, you can do exactly the same with Fiona. So um, if you've got some burning questions or you're just interested in getting involved in that chat, please do. And then let me just stop showing. And then next Tuesday, I know Phoebe mentioned also, but um, Hospital Room has been amazing in having these Tuesday afternoon participatory workshops. So um, next week it is, is it Hannah, Phoebe, I think? Yeah, next it's week. Hannah Brown. Yeah. Okay, let me just quickly, I'll just quickly share so you can get a little sense of what she will be doing. So hang on a minute, where is it, where is it? Hannah Brown, there she is. Okay, share. Okay, hopefully you can see that kind of okay-ish, sort of, <laughs> don't know, <laughs> hopefully. But, um, but yeah, do please sign up for that. Any any of um, any of our workshops and events, it's all on the Make Your Mark website, which is make your mark um, make your mark NHS .org. So do go and have a look, um, and you can sign up for stuff there, which would be great. Um, but that's it from us for this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Just want to say a massive thanks to our funders, who are the wonderful Arts Council England and NHS Charities Together, the fabulous Trust Charity Heads On fundraised for this whole program. So we just want to say a huge thank you and a shout out to shout out to them because otherwise we wouldn't be able to do all of this lovely stuff but yeah and then that's it just thank you so much for coming thanks for giving your time thanks for being here um i know it is a very weird one that we can't be together and and share and see each other but um i hope as it is for me i hope it is for you actually it feels a really it's really wonderful to be able to come together albeit virtually um, and have these shared experiences of being creative together um but yeah so hopefully see you friday or next Tuesday, but yeah, come, come, please do come back and spread the word. Anyone associated with the trust is more than welcome to be part of this program. Um, all right, I think that's it. So a big bye bye for me. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>